Before I start my countdown of my picks for 2014's worst films, I want to do a quick comparison of, with my 2013 picks. Every film this year is worse than Man of Steel, as even though I had many, many problems with that film and still enjoy ranting about it, at least it has some scenes which I feel were genuinely good. Also, no film here is as bad as our IPD, which had zero redeeming qualities and is one of the worst films I have ever paid money to see in a theater. Also, this is all just my opinion. So if you disagree, I'm going to paraphrase Lindsay Ellis, the nostalgia chick, and say that you should be happy you got some joy from these films that I did not. This is all subjective, as most film criticism is, so if you find you liked any of these, I genuinely feel good for you. Just please don't try to tell me I'm wrong and should like them just like you do. Except in one case where I genuinely do not know why people seem to like the film, as I genuinely don't get it, but, but, but we'll get to that. So with the preliminaries out of the way, here are my top 12 least favorite films of 2014. Number 12, If I Stay. There is some potential in a story about an out-of-body experience, which is how this movie was sold. However, what's actually presented on screen is a contrived love story that hits every single sappy emotional note it can. This is a story where the main character loses her entire family in a car crash, is told by her grandfather that she can go, but decides not to because her ex-boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, whom she recently broke up with, wrote a song for her. Uh, why is this not higher then? Because I sat there in the theater watching him thinking, I recognize every emotional note that this film is trying to make me feel. And I can't hate it because I actually do kind of like Chloe Grace Moretz as an actress. And I kind of like cello music. So, that's why this is only number 12. Number 11. The Maze Runner. I think there might be an interesting story in here somewhere, but the execution was just botched. This is an exposition-heavy film, and it contains some elements which are contradicted by the visuals, such as, we're told the vines don't go all the way to the top, but we look at the background, the vines go all the way to the top. And to have the concerns of the lead character who's trying to say, well, how, how have you tried to get out of here? Just brushed off and, yeah, we tried it, we tried it, we tried it. It's very unsatisfying. Still, with that said, it kind of started to work a little bit in the middle, and then it hit an ending sequence, which is just a complete mess and makes no fucking sense whatsoever. Yeah, I know, you're trying to set it up for a sequel, but there are good ways to do that, and there are bad ways, and this is one of the worst ways I have ever seen to set up a sequel. It also suffers from a problem that a lot of films in this genre have, you know, the young adult films. And that is that young actors tend to not be very good. And some of them here are okay, but a lot of them are just... No, they, they don't work. Not at all, I'm sorry. This film is just a bit of a mess. Had some nice imagery, parts of it worked, but overall, give it a pass. Number 10. The Giver. Unlike The Maze Runner, most people I've talked to have said this is actually a pretty good book, and it's apparently required reading in some schools. But, uh, I never read it. It sounds like an interesting concept, but it doesn't translate well to the screen. One of the problems is that this is supposed to be a world where emotions are suppressed, and given the medium of film, it's very difficult to pull off, at least in an entertaining way, because, you know, we're entertained by seeing people express emotions, but when everybody's just kind of talking very blandly, it's... there's nothing to pull you into the film. And even then, Okay, if your emotions are suppressed and nobody's supposed to feel sad or happy, how come people are laughing at sometimes? It th doesn't follow. Uh, the result is a film that just kind of plods along from scene to scene without much momentum or emotional attachment to the events. And while the acting is superior to the maze runner, uh, the dry story just left me feeling kind of bored. Number nine, Transformers Age of Extinction. I bet you a lot of people expected to see this one on the list, and guess what? It's there! Give the film this credit. Wahlberg is a far more enjoyable character to watch on screen than LaBeouf ever was. And there are actually a couple of scenes, particularly ones he's in, that are enjoyable. Still, as with every other previous entry in the series, 
It wants to concentrate on the human characters instead of the robots, and the plot is nonsensical and full of contrivances. And the life of this... Oh! You could cut 45 minutes of this film, and it probably would be decent, watchable action flick, but I swear, Michael Bay just wants to throw explosions and explosions and explosions all scene, and then we're going to have a slow-mo, because film, make, film says you have to have a slow moment to have to let the audience calm down, and it's between these awful... Boring human characters. What do we want to hear the robots? We want to hear them interact. And I was checked out at the two-hour mark, and that was before the Dinobots showed up, and hey, at least we got to see Prime riding Grimlock, but it wasn't worth it. It really wasn't. Number eight, Earth to Echo. Annoying child characters who talk like the idealized children as imagined by adults, save a cute alien robot. Plot sound familiar? Yeah, this movie wants to be E.T. so bad while failing to understand what made that film good at a fundamental level. Have the kids actually talk like kids and give them more than stereotypical characters. And the narration on this film was very poorly used. It's like, we could see this stuff happening. Why are you actually narrating what's happening? Not to mention, entire film is, is in shaky cam style. And I had a massive headache walking out of this. But, hey... The robot's cute. That That's something, right? I need to gather myself before this next one, okay? Because... How the hell did this film win three Golden Globes, including Best Picture? Number seven. Boyhood. Yeah, that's right. Some of you already know I hated this fucking film. I've already done a rant on this film, and I'll post a longer text rant in the description of this video. As if I went into every single reason why I hate this fucking film, I wouldn't be able to get to the other six films, which are even worse than that. This is the one I was talking about earlier. If you want to blast me for hating this film, please, 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 tell me what and why you liked about this. Because I, 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 I was so fucking bored watching this thing. The one thing I'll touch on. Right at the beginning of this film, we're introduced to the mother character, and I was watching how this was being set up, and I thought, okay, so this is going to happen. What is the most cliché thing they can do with this setup? And those of you who watched the film know what happened. As soon as I realized that, yep, they're going with that cliché, I completely checked out of this film. Nothing else in this film worked for me after that point. Not a thing. Because it's just riddled with fucking cliches. And, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, they filled it over 12 years. I don't fucking care. What was on the screen was not worth that 12-year investment, especially since apparently, I, I think it was Richard Roper said, it was only 39 days over those 12 years. Oh, boy, yeah, that's a huge commitment. Oh, yeah, what the, okay, an actor could drop out, could be dead or whatever, but it's, it's just over three days a year. Fuck off. Okay. Dun, dun. If you like this, please tell me why. I want to try to understand why. Some of the visuals are okay. Kind of like Ethan Hawke's character until he became a, just the fucking boring like everybody else. But okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Read more below. <sighs> All right, I'm done. Number six, right along. Yeah, you're probably thinking, well, why? Why is this on the film? Why is it working? Why is why are you mentioning this? It's just kind of, yeah. But that's the thing. It's just a forgettable buddy cop film, and it's not very funny. Just kind of there, being something to watch, and felt like a complete waste of time. Which, really, given that the day I went to go see this, my plan was to just go see the Lego Movie and then her. But I got there too late for the showing of the Lego Movie that I wanted to see it had been sold out. So I said, you know what? I don't want to go home, so I'm going to go watch something else instead. And it was either Ride Along or Vampire Academy. I still think I made the right choice. As bad as this film was, I still think I made the right choice. Anyway, number five. Annie. One word. Auto-tune. They used auto-tune on the songs. You can tell the people are not actually singing the words because they use fucking auto-tune on the songs. Now, I can enjoy a musical. 
I've been in a few. I'm in one now. I'm in the production of South Pacific. It's kind of fun. I, I went to see Into the Woods. It's not on my best list, but it's enjoyable. It's having a lot of fun. It's probably because it doesn't really take itself too seriously. This one, though, somehow tries to base itself in real life with real-life consequences, but then goes off on these over-the-top mo musical montage numbers, which reminds me, stuff happens in a montage that makes no sense except in the context of a montage, and even some of the world, real-world consequences of what's happening are just kind of brushed off for humor, like this cell phone company is collecting data on every one of its customers' calls. It's recording every one of its customers' calls and mining that for data, and it's kind of brushed off, and th that's horrible! It's saved a little bit because just Jamie Foxx and Rose Byrne are actually kind of charismatic and they have good chemistry. But Cameron Diaz, oh my, what are you doing here? You can't sing, even when you try to pretend like you're singing. As bad as the auto-tune is, your, I'm, your, your lips are not matching the words that are coming out of your mouth. Not even close. Number four, A Million Ways to Die in the West. Hey. Did you hear that there are a lot of ways to die in the West? I did, because this movie insists on telling me every single minute that there are a million ways to die in the West. And it keeps repeating that joke again and again and again, along with every other contrived joke. There's nothing... If you keep trying to beat the joke into the people's head, they are quickly going to lose interest, and that's what I did. I liked Ted. I really liked Ted. I thought Ted was hilarious. This is not Ted. This is just not funny. Uh, oh, one of the jokes that they throw out. They're a couple and, uh, you know, they're wait, they're saving themselves for marriage because they want to be a good Christian couple. The joke is that she's a prostitute. I'm sorry, honey, but I can't afford our dinner tonight. That's okay. I'm getting fucked in the butt tonight. Hey, get up here. I want to fuck you in the ass. Coming. Repeat at least five or six times. It's not funny the first time. Why is it funny the second? Neil Patrick Harris shits in two hats because he's been given a laxative. Number three. Transcendence. I really wanted to like this next one. I really did. How the hell do you take an interesting premise, like taking someone's mind and putting it into a computer and make something this boring? Oh my god. Gosh, this was so fucking boring. I'll give it this. It was directed by Christopher Nolan's favorite cinematographer. It has some absolutely gorgeous shots in it. But the guy has no idea how to pace a film. This just dragged on and on and on with nothing happening. And, oh, look, something happening. And, oh, boy, oh, boy. I was just trying to stay awake for this entire film, and well, I almost failed at a couple of times to do so. And uh, it's it's also one of these plots where, okay, are we supposed to root for the mind in a computer that seems to be doing all these shady things? To like, he's taking control of people. He's yeah, sure, he's fixing their physical ailments, but he's taking control of their minds. But at the same time, I really don't want to root for the terrorist who killed a bunch of AI researchers at the beginning of the film who are trying to take him down. Like, the plot could be fixed just by someone saying, Hey, Johnny Depp's character, what are you actually trying to do here? Oh, I'm doing this to try to fix the world. Oh. But then, of course, you wouldn't have this boring-ass film. Number two... Sex tape. Hello again, Cameron Diaz. A two-hour-long advertisement by Sony Pictures for the Apple iPad, mixed in with some crude sex humor. I felt insulted watching this film. You're not funny. You're not funny. And Cameron Diaz, you are a horrible, horrible actress. I used to like you in some stuff. I actually kind of liked something about Mary. I liked the original Mask film, but here, no. Somewhere along the way, you lost it. Please go away and never come back. One more film to go, but before then, here are some dishonorable mentions that just were not quite bad enough to make this list. The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies. Why was this three films? At least, at least the series is now over and we can forget it ever happened. 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. How the hell do you make a silly premise even more stupid? Have the turtles learn jujitsu from a book that for some reason got flushed down the sewer. That scene in the elevator. That was actually pretty cool. That's what kept this from being on my worst list. And it's under two hours long. The interview. The first 45 minutes of this film is aggressively unfunny. Once Kim Jong-un shows up, it does start to get a little bit funny. At least I found it started to get funny. was not enough to save it from being completely unrecommendable. Divergent. A lame Hunger Games ripoff with an even worse love story and a nonsensical society. Wait, wait, wait. So that you test the kids so that you can put them into a faction. But then they could choose which faction they want to go in. And then there's a test inside the faction that makes no fucking sense. It does have some decent acting and some of the training sequences are okay. But overall, this is just watch the Hunger Games films. They're much better. And finally, before we get to number one, Robocop. Which doesn't know whether it wants to be an action movie or a political movie and therefore does neither very well. It completely lacks any of the humor of the original, but honestly, if you forget that Robocop is on the title, it's, yeah, it's just not a very good film. Some people will say, okay, it's called Robocop, your expectations should be higher, but meh, I don't really care about that. Okay, so now we get to my least favorite film of the year, and I am sorry to say that, once again, Mr. Reynolds, welcome to the bottom of the list. Number one, The Captive. I honestly swear I don't have anything against Ryan Reynolds and am genuinely looking forward to him in a proper Deadpool film. But this, this was a mess. It's told out of order time-wise, but as everything looks the same, there's no cue to tell you what time frame you're in. So, that's very confusing that way, and there's no suspense because in the first scene, you see who the kidnapper is. If you're supposed to keep people in suspense, don't show people who your villain is right off the top. Uh, it's also one of these films that relies on everybody being stupid. The police department is stupid. The chief detective, when her niece is talking to the daughter who was kidnapped, and the daughter's a horrible actress, by the way, the chief decides to show herself on screen, which, of course, the feeds immediately cut, and the detective who had the niece on screen, he and the chief start talking in front of the camera, so of course the kidnappers can hear every single freaking word they're saying. But uh, I'm not letting the kidnappers off the case here, because as much as they talk about how good their security, their web security is, and how they can't penetrate this site, they're stupid as hell. Like, they, they talk to the, the girl, the daughter's a figure skater, they talk to her former partner, when they should know, because they've been spying on him, that Ryan Reynolds shows up at this rink every so often to look at him skate. He sees them there, like, follows them. Like, the, what Ryan Reynolds is a landscaper, and his job's put off, so he stays at a motel. The daughter wants to see him, so the kidnapper takes the truck full of, or the trailer full of trees off the back of his truck, and sets those trees up in a line along the road, leading Ryan Reynolds to the daughter. Oh, it's a, isn't it just coincidence that Ryan Reynolds is the only one who thinks to follow these trees to see where they lead? <sighs> it makes no, it's one of the most stupid movies I've ever seen. The only thing that keeps it from being one of the worst films I've ever paid money to see is Ryan Reynolds. He's actually kind of enjoyable. You can honestly feel for him having lost his daughter like that. But the rest of the film is just a frickin' mess. There we go. The Captive. My pick for worst film of 2014. Feel free to disagree. Let me know in the comments. I will talk to you later.